Hello and welcome to Civil War Weekly, the podcast that answers the question, what happened this week in the American Civil War? I'm your host, Tim Patrick, and this is episode 156, March 11th to March 17th, 1864. Last week, we had George Armstrong Custer and his Rio Hill engagement. While not necessarily unsuccessful, it certainly is a far cry from the dashing Cavalier-type action we associate him with. I will probably sound like a broken record, but unit cohesion, even in the latter stages of the war, is going to be super important. We also had Ulysses S. Grant taking charge, and the opening of Andersonville. We have talked briefly before about the Confederate prison, but I think it is worth going in depth with such an important site the place where many captured Union soldiers died in terrible conditions. This week, we're to give our attention to Nathaniel Banks and the Red River Campaign. Of course, before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about our Patreon content, and of course, this month, we did go back to the well of a movie review, and we did our dual movie review of The Beguiled, two different versions of that movie, that if you put it all together, I think there's actually some pretty good stuff that we can talk about in terms of historical accuracy in the Civil War. We also did the Red Badge of Courage last month recently, as well as a statistical analysis. And we're, I think we're going to go back to the well of a movie next month as well, and then some picture slideshows, especially as we get into the Overland campaign. A lot of important sites that we have with that, that maybe you didn't grasp the historical significance of. So that's what we have on deck coming up, and if any of that sounds like it would interest you, there is a link to the Patreon in the show description, and those proceeds do go toward the general upkeep of the show. Let's first get familiar with the Red River as we recap what's been going on in this theater of the war. Now, we may have mentioned the Red River as being important for getting supplies into the rest of the Confederacy from Texas, or at least... This was super important until Vicksburg Falls. If we were to look at the boot that is Louisiana, the Mississippi is going to run all along the eastern border, but two main rivers will cut into the state itself. The Ouachita River runs relatively parallel with Mississippi in the eastern part of the state and forks with the Red River, which will cut into the shin part of the boot, flowing by Shreveport, and then eventually making its way to Texas. The Red River Valley was important for several reasons, though. Before the war, it was a prosperous area for cotton as well as sugarcane. Residents gained profit farming or by providing support functions for plantation operations. But it may surprise you to know that many in the region were Unionists, especially after the fall of New Orleans. In the 1860 elections, they had not been one-sided when it came to the voting. In fact, James Madison Wells was named the lieutenant governor under Lincoln's new administration for the state, and he hails from the area. As in many other regions of the South, the Red River Valley was a good example of how the war was making individuals turn allegiance. Or at least if they were on the fence, they were going to come off it. Of course, the war would make its first round of those who were eager to join up for the South. Once these were gone, and as the war progressed, then they would turn to conscription to fill the ranks. We have touched on how class warfare was alive in these conscriptions as poor farmers were used for this purpose. The Confederates would have problems enforcing the conscriptions, though, and many who do not want to serve would form their own outlaw bands known as Jayhawkers by the locals. We have talked about how there were legit military operations conducted against these bands by rebel cavalry, as they were a nuisance. Cotton, of course, was the big crop in the area. As we have already mentioned, Sugar King was as well, so lack of an effective workforce to man these efforts, support systems in the form of smaller farmers or merchants, and a union blockade would lead to many farms and plantations being abandoned, with refugees streaming abroad. Confederate confiscation would also lead to a depletion in resources. There was still cotton ready to be shipped and stored, which would potentially be burned rather than fall into Union hands, but also might turn a profit when talking to the right Union speculator. 
the price of cotton was obviously high, given that it was no longer as readily available. David Dixon Porter would call these individuals who were profiting off of this rats, but that did not mean he did not also personally benefit from captured cotton. A big goal of the upcoming Red River campaign would be the cotton, money always being a powerful motivator, especially if you could potentially get it for free. Nathaniel Banks has been criticized for being involved in profit from cotton, but he was not really as directly involved as he was sending it back to New Orleans. Remember, he is a politician after all. In 1864, obviously, considering that Shreveport was where Kirby Smith was making his headquarters, this would be a key objective. You see, as we have highlighted in previous episodes, the federal forces, despite having captured Vicksburg, were not yet secure. Continued rebel military presences would make that position and that of the river precarious. Guerrillas would continue their activity, so it was not necessarily 100% secure. As we have noted, guerrillas are often emboldened when the enemy has bigger fish to fry. In this case, we have Kirby Smith as that bigger fish. So we might safely assume that elimination of that threat would have positive ramifications. But there is also the fact that the Lincoln administration wants to establish pro-Union governments, so getting Smith out of Louisiana would also be good toward that objective. We know that Nathaniel Banks has been interested in trying some kind of campaigning, maybe getting at Texas, which is a big prize. Remember that there was a brief invasion of Texas with the capture of Brownsville. Indeed, there had been some grand designs uh, with the Second Battle of Sabine Pass to try to break into the Lone Star State and create some havoc. But there had been a large amount of setbacks, not limited to the federal disaster at Chickamauga. Remember how there is a big shuffling, especially as the Army of the Cumberland comes under siege and then briefly Knoxville as well. Call it a proximity bias, but East Tennessee would be a big priority, already being mostly pro-Union and supplying a large amount of troops to the Northern War effort. Not so was Texas, so that needed to be put on the back burner. In my opinion, despite the Confederacy being on the back foot in the region, a capture of Texas and Louisiana was going to be far-fetched. Just the large territory and the large amount of troops that it would take to subdue the regions would be a hard ask, even if there were reinforcements shifting to the region instead of elsewhere. But with Louisiana stalemated and Texas at least having federal colors flying in small southern parts of the state, it was now time for more. As we mentioned, Nathaniel Banks is a political general. He wants to make sure he can get a little glory and hopefully build some steam to continue his political career once the war is complete. You see, Banks has not had a good time thus far in the war. We had the Valley Campaign of 1862, which was a personal disaster. The advance up Bayou Teche, which accomplished very little, and the successful action at Port Hudson, and finally the failed attempts in Louisiana and Texas. Banks needs a W, and Halleck is going to give him a chance to accomplish that. Here's the thing, too, about Nathaniel Banks, is that he already comes up with this idea to launch an attack up the Red River and capture Shreveport. It's not necessarily what Ulysses S. Grant would do. It's not necessarily conducive to the rest of his plans, but there had already been these preparations made. Halleck had already approved it, so by the time Grant takes control, he's sort of inclined to let it go through. Right? He would much rather have Banks attack Mobile because Mobile would be in supporting distance of Sherman's operations in Georgia and Sherman is in supporting distance of Grant and Meade in Virginia. Remember those interior lines. And if all of those forces are in closer proximity attacking the Confederates all at once, then there's going to be a very limited opportunity for the Confederates to actually shift forces elsewhere, right? So... Grant doesn't necessarily want this Red River campaign, but it's going to go through anyway. It's also, it's tough to say, right, like that money is 100% the motivator in this particular campaign. We have seen Butler also facing charges of potential corruption in this area. And certainly Banks wouldn't be the only general who profits from this taking of the cotton in this particular area, sugarcane as well, right? But I'm going to let you see the campaign unfold as we get into it with these 
next couple of episodes, and then maybe you can form your own opinion of whether it was necessary and exactly what exactly it accomplished either. So we need to develop the plan that will be the Red River Campaign. Three different contingents would be used converging on the rebel positions. Of course, Banks would move his forces, but he would be joined by additional troops from Vicksburg. We have highlighted the 19th Corps, and two divisions of the 13th Corps would be under his command. The 13th Corps would be under Thomas Ransom, with two divisions, one under Robert Cameron and the other under William Landrum. Robert Cameron had been a Republican before the war and briefly commanded the 19th Indiana, who, we know, went on to serve in the Iron Brigade. He shifted to the Western Theater and would go on to become involved in farming operations in Colorado after the conflict. Landrum was a lawyer and publisher before the war. The Kentucky native had already seen action in our story, serving under William T. Sherman in various campaigns. The 19th Corps is going to be under, initially, William Franklin, with divisions under Cuvier Grover and William Emery. Emery was a Maryland native and career soldier, serving in the War of Mexico, as well as being a topographical engineer, so he's pretty smart. He would continue to serve in the Army past the war's conclusion. Cavalry would be under Albert Lee, a lawyer from New York, who had moved to Kansas and served in the 7th Kansas Cavalry. He had been in our story before, taking over for Theophilus Gerard and leading his troops in the assaults on Vicksburg. The Vicksburg contingent would be parts of the 16th and 17th Corps, veteran troops that could add 10,000 men to his numbers. It would be under the overall command of Andrew Smith, with divisions under Joseph Maurer and Thomas Kilby Smith. David Dixon Porter, who had already proven to be an adept river operator, would also provide the necessary naval support. Additionally, Steele would move down from Arkansas, hopefully catching the enemy in a pincer movement, adding more weight with 14,000 men. Banks and his command would move back up the Bayou Teche region to Alexandria, which was the mouth of the Red River, a place they had been before, if you recall, pushing Taylor back up there before Port Hudson. Unfortunately, they had stripped the area of resources pretty well, so keep that in mind. Kirby Smith would be in charge of creating a defense to stop Banks, as it was his department. Now, we've already mentioned Smith in previous episodes, and how he needs to put together something out of nothing, essentially. It should also be pointed out that he has a lot of autonomy when it comes to his command. His communication with Richmond is severed, so he kind of does what he wants. Now, if you recall Perryville in 1862, he sort of did what he wanted in that campaign, or at the very least, was more interested in independent command. So being left on his own most likely suited him just fine. He would be quoted as to having said his control over the region was absolute. Smith will realize that he's not going to be able to properly meet his enemy in an open field. Even with calling for additional troops to join his department, he's only going to be able to gather together between 10 and 15,000 compared to 30,000 of the enemy. Now, I don't know if you all are numbers people, but those are not good odds. Richard Taylor is still going to want to meet the enemy in the field using a mobile army. Remember, Walker's Greyhounds. In fact, the son of a former U.S. president will be quoted as having said he would fight Banks if he had a million men. Now, remember, too, that Taylor had been with Jackson, and Jackson had drubbed Banks during the Shenandoah Valley campaign of 1862. So maybe Taylor is drawing off his experience and his generally low opinion of Banks. Remember how Winchester, he gets routed, right? And there's a very real opportunity for Jackson to completely cut off that army if he has the proper support from Turner Ashby which he does not, and that's why he kind of bumps heads with Ashby. So if the cavalry had been present, then maybe he would have been able to work his way around them and then really have an even bigger victory than he already has. So Taylor is already very familiar with Banks. He has a low opinion of him, and that's probably influencing some of his words here. You can also combine that with some of his already successful operations in the region thus far. Smith, though, would not really share in this confidence. His plan would call for a lot of construction, building defenses that would hopefully slow down the large federal forces. 
Shreveport would be fortified, and an ambitious project on the Red River to lower the water level would be launched. This would be because Smith does not want the guns of the U.S. Navy to be used against him, especially at Shreveport. So many times here along the Mississippi especially, we have seen that the river fleet is super important to federal success. And obviously, if you take that off the table, you're facing better odds. Despite having an ironclad, the CSS Missouri, there was an air of desperation when compared to Porter's larger command, which included rumors of trying to create submarines like the CSS Hunley. Fort DeRessy, which sat near where the Red River meets the Mississippi, would be strengthened as well. Now this work is going to be the subject later on in the episode, and it's actually been in our story before. It was this fort that fired on the Star of the West, forcing her to run aground. You remember we mentioned that in connection with Porter's operations to try to bottle up the Red and prevent supplies from getting to Vicksburg, or anywhere else for that matter. Smith would set about his various designs in wait. Taylor would be the primary field commander, and will have divisions under Walker and Alvard Mouton, which included Camille de Polganac, which we mentioned way back in 1861 as Prince Polcat. Walker would have brigades under Thomas Wall, Horace Randall, and William Reed Scurry. Thomas Wall should sound familiar as he served in the Siege of Vicksburg, commanding Wall's Texas Legion. Before the war, Wall was involved in trying to get a seat in the Confederate Congress, and after the war, he will practice law in Texas. Horace Randall had attended West Point, serving in the U.S. Dragoons against the Apache in his pre-war life. He would be under Braxton Bragg at Pensacola early in the war, but as often the case in the beginning stages of the conflict, will resign because there were those junior him in the old army that were higher in rank in the Confederate Army. He had returned to Texas to raise a cavalry regiment and served under Henry McCullough during the operations around Vicksburg. William Reed Scurry, you should remember from the operations in New Mexico, being the primary battlefield commander at Glorieta Pass. Mouton would have brigades under Prince Polcat and Henry Gray. Gray, you might remember as being involved in some of the operations in Louisiana thus far. Sterling Price, who has been all over our story, is going to have divisions under Thomas Churchill and brigades commanded by James Tappan and Mosby Parsons. Tappan was a Yale graduate who had moved to Arkansas, previously serving in the House of Representatives for that state. He will go on to practice law and return to politics after the war, serving as the Speaker of the House for the state, House of Representatives. Cavalry, of course, will be commanded by the stalwart Tom Green. Now, the main preparation for the campaign would be conducted by none other than our old friend, Charles Pomeroy Stone, who served as the Chief of Staff for Banks. If you remember Charles Pomeroy Stone, he gets blamed for Ball's Bluff. The Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War is going to really lay down the hammer on him. It's not really going to be particularly fair. And now he is finally, beginning in 1864, getting his very brief redemption story. Banks, in the meantime, was busy doing the political things he was particularly adept at. It's been pointed out to me in more than one source that he didn't have a good understanding of government and might have been a good candidate of being assigned to set up the governments of Louisiana and Texas on purpose. Really, he might just have been a cast-off from the East, but why not kill two birds with one stone? Speaking of stones, it would not be easy for Charles Stone to coordinate all the troops at the Union disposal. If you were paying attention when we listed off all the units that would make up the expedition, we would be safe to assume that they are all coming from a variety of sources, and so they would not have any cohesion. Additionally, there would really be no overall commander for the expedition, as Banks was busy with his tasks, and of course the securing of the cotton. Still we have the opening of the campaign, as the wheels set in motion. A.J. Smith would be moved from Vicksburg, and make a landing near Fort DeRussey in March. On the 14th, they would probe toward the work, which was particularly formidable, or at least considered as such. An earthen fort, complete with rifle pits and an armored battery, the fort would be necessary to be dealt with if Porter's Navy was going to offer support. 
Kirby Smith, meanwhile, did not like the skirmishing that was happening involving Smith's veteran command. Taylor would pull the majority of the men back, but there would still be 300 or so garrisoning the work. Joseph Mauer's men would be selected for assault by Smith. On the 14th, they would attack the fort and take it by storm, suffering only some 48 casualties. The majority of the Confederates would surrender. Now that Fort Duressi was gone, the Red River was open for traffic and subsequently invasion. Even as Porter moved his gunboats into the Red River proper, the Union troops would win a second relatively bloodless victory. Taylor had pushed forward elements of Louisiana cavalry and artillery to check on any progress of the now-landed Yankee army. This would be doubly important, not just for intelligence purposes, but also because in this campaign, there would be longer distances marched. Now, the East would have some tough marching, this is true, but it would be on less developed roads in Louisiana. Many soldiers were right about the hardships of moving over the variety of terrains and in less than ideal conditions. With all the columns converging as well, having accurate intel would be key to the defense of the region. Remember that the Union Army is not going to be well coordinated, if I haven't already mentioned that, which will become an issue, although they will do well enough. Joseph Maurer, whose nickname, remember, is the Wolf, would put together a task force of cavalry and infantry to move quickly. Using a local guide, he would navigate this command to Henderson's Hill. The use of the local for intelligence purposes is something we should bookmark and also see an example of the region having split convictions. Getting into position, Maurer would capture the mobile command and the artillery without much of a fight at all. This would be yet another setback for Taylor, who now would be without this command to give him information. The Red River campaign had begun, and already things were not going to be looking too well for the rebels. So we're going to go ahead and call it a day there. We covered an introduction to the Red River campaign, introducing key figures in that operation. After setting the stage for the action and the region background, we had the Battle of Fort DeRussey, being a Union victory that truly kicks off the campaign. Next week, we're going to talk about the CSS Alabama a little more in depth, and then head out west to see what's going on in the farther reaches of the country. If you like what you hear, please make sure to leave a review. Posted in the description should be a link to the website as well as Patreon and Venmo information. Support for the general upkeep of the show is greatly appreciated. Feedback's always welcome. Questions, comments, concerns, the email is cwweeklypod at gmail.com. Thank you all so much for listening and have a great week.